Welcome, darlings. This is Rujam. In today's podcast, I'm going to cover Matthew 3 of the Gospels. Before I begin, I want you all to remember that everyone is welcome here. I do not care who you are, nor do I care what your background is. If you decide to stay, yet you get offended by the end, I still do not care. Let us continue from where we left off from the previous podcasts. We thoroughly covered the Gospels in order. Take out your Bibles, take out your Bible journals, pens, highlighters, anything that you need to take notes with if you decide to do so. The book of Matthew chapter 3 begins with, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet, says, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew 3, 2, John the Baptist is warning everyone to repent of their sins because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is speaking of God's eternal kingdom, and it shall last forever and ever. God's kingdom is exclusive to followers of Christ after Judgment Day. If one refuses to repent, refuses to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, the Son of God who died for our sins, refuses to sin no more and to be baptized and be reborn they shall not make it to his kingdom if one blasphemes god they shall not make it to his kingdom the kingdom of god was also prophesied by daniel in the old testament daniel two forty four and in the days of these kings shall the god of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Even Daniel prophesied that the kingdom of God will only open its gates to certain people, and this is a kingdom unlike any other, because it is not earthly, and it shall last forever and ever. John the Baptist himself was foretold by the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament. Know that every single book in the Bible prophesied the arrival of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 43 The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, 
make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Not only is Isaiah referring to John the Baptist, but he is so specific to the point where he is speaking of John, who will be warning others to be prepared because the Lord himself is going to come down in the flesh. John's physical description is indeed very interesting. It just goes on to prove that God will not hesitate to use anyone to help bring others to his kingdom. Do not be surprised that God's chosen people are sometimes unusual, or that we shall be complete outcasts from the rest of society. In fact, God called us to stand out from this world because we follow him. We follow Jesus. That is why we are hated and persecuted throughout this world. If they hated him, if they crucified and killed him, they will come for us too. Many are confused as to why baptism is so important in our walk with Christ. Jesus told us that we must be reborn again. What does this mean? It means that we must be renewed and reborn, both spiritually and physically. I am sure that some of you have heard of witches comparing a biblical baptism to an abomination ritual. That is because they do not know what they speak of. They are earthly. They are worldly. They do not comprehend that we must be reborn in the sense where we know that this earth is not our home. They do not understand because they are not of God. When a woman is pregnant and is carrying a child, God made it so that the child is physically growing in water. When the child is born, they are pure and sinless. However, as the child grows and time passes by, they willingly choose to sin every day. Think of what happened with Noah. Not only were they sinning, they were sinning to an extent where they were creating abomination hybrids between mankind and fallen angels, thus resulting in titans also known as the Nephilim. What did God do with all of these sinful humans and hybrid freaks? He caused a massive flood to destroy and cleanse this world. And this is exactly why we must be reborn, because of how sinful we as humans have chosen to be, and because we live in a sinful world, a world that was corrupted by the enemy, and we as humans are as much to blame for willingly going along with it. What do these examples tell us? That we must be reborn. We must be reborn physically. We must be reborn spiritually. Think of the baptism water as a second womb. And when you emerge from that water, you are reborn, but this time you have the Holy Spirit. You have God with you. And to keep this baptism, this rebirth from being in vain, you have to live every second of your life for God. This includes waking, eating, sleeping, working, breathing, even falling asleep because spiritual warfare is a real thing. You must sin no more and you have to understand that God created you to be born in this wicked world because he has a plan and a purpose for you. The harsh truth is that if you do not live your life for God, your existence is utterly meaningless. As long as one denies God, one denies Jesus, they will be empty on the inside for as long as they live. And because they chose to blaspheme and live wickedly and do evil deeds, because they chose the path of destruction for themselves, then God will destroy them. Another thing that God hates most in this world is hypocrites and hypocrisy. These are people who say that they will change or pretend to change in front of others, promising them that they will do certain things and they do not. These are people like the Pharisees and Sadducees who were there watching as John would baptize others. These are people who appear righteous and sinless to the crowd, yet inside they are rotten and they are rotting everyone else that they corrupt with their serpent ideologies. This is why both John and Jesus in a different chapter 
both call them out as being the generation of vipers. And these people are demented and delusional, but they have gaslit themselves into thinking that they can flee from the wrath of God. But if you've read the word, then you would already know that God hates those who corrupt others with false and godly doctrines. And because they cause a stumbling block in front of others, their punishment will be even severe. Matthew 3 8. John tells these Pharisees and Sadducees to bring forth therefore fruits and meat for repentance. What does this mean? He is speaking of fruits that we as human beings choose to consume. And John is not referring to a literal fruit that you can eat. He is referring to the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In my previous podcast, I already established that God, that Jesus is the tree of life, and that is why he came down in the flesh to die for our sins. He died on a wooden tree cross, because Jesus was showing the entire world that he is the tree of life. The only way to the Father is through him. And the only way to have everlasting life is through him. So when John is telling us to bring forth fruit, meets repentance, he is telling us to choose a tree of life. Choose fruit from the tree of life. Choose God till your very last breath. If one chooses the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then they are choosing sin. The first sin The forbidden fruit wasn't even about eating literal physical fruit. It was a decision to willingly sin by going against what God commanded and doing the exact opposite, which is committing evil. Make no mistake that God's very first warning to mankind was that he forbade humans from choosing the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And just because this happened thousands of years ago, does not mean that it still does not stand today. God's word is law. God's word is final. Every single person in this world, other than Jesus because he is Lord and the Lord is sinless, other than that every single human being to exist and to walk this earth has consumed of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If one decides to bring forth fruit from the forbidden tree, and that means that they do not bring forth good fruit met for repentance, and God will cast them to the lake of fire to be tormented for eternity, alongside the fallen angels and demons. Matthew 3.11 John truthfully tells us that he that comes after him is mightier than John himself, whose shoes that John is not worthy to bear. The one after John is Jesus himself, And John also tells us that Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This means that he will baptize his true followers, his sheep with the Holy Ghost who is God's Spirit. Remember that our human bodies are the temple of the Lord and that he will dwell within us because he loves us and we truly love him. However, once God divides his sheep from the worldly goats, He will cast those sinful goats into the fire. Jesus is also the reaper of this world. He shall reap and divide the sheep from the goats. He shall reap and divide the wheat from the tares and cast them into an unquenchable fire, devoid of life, devoid of God, also known as the second and ultimate death. Matthew 3.13 Jesus arrives from Galilee to Jordan so that John can baptize him as well. John tells him that he should be the one getting baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. However, Jesus tells him that it has to be this way in order to fulfill all righteousness. John ends up baptizing Jesus, and the moment that Jesus rose from the water, the heavens opened unto him, and God's Holy Spirit descended to him like a dove. And there are heavenly light and God's light shining all over him. This is Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 11.2 And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, 
the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost, is God's Spirit. And when we are baptized, God's Spirit, who is still God himself, dwells within us. The Holy Spirit is how God teaches us, whether it's wisdom, understanding, hidden knowledge, and whatever else he may teach or counsel us to do. This is how God communicates with us, and this is how one hears God's voice. He himself said that his sheep know his voice, and if you are someone who has heard God's voice, then you know that God's voice is very quiet and calm and peaceful when he is speaking to you. And lastly, Matthew three seventeen, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God, he is proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God for the entire world to see and for others to spread the word as well. He is declaring that Jesus is the Son of God as prophesied in Psalm 2-7, Isaiah 42-1, in Ephesians 1 6. One cannot claim to love the Messiah yet deny Jesus Christ. If one denies that the Messiah is the Son of God who is the Lord in the flesh, then they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are ungodly and serve the demonic evil agenda of this world. If one truly loves God, they would love Jesus as well because they know that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one God the Father above on his throne, Jesus, the Lord in the flesh, our shepherd, the Messiah, the mediator between man and God who shed his blood for our sins, the word of God, and lastly, the Holy Spirit, which is God's spirit and how he teaches and communicates with us. This is how he comforts his sheep because the Holy Spirit is also known as the Comforter. These are our Messiah and Luke 1019 necklaces, fully coated black metal. The rectangle style is unisex, whereas the Victorian one is not. Message us on Instagram at Rujam Official if you are interested in purchasing a necklace. Spread the word of God through jewelry, even to unbelievers because you never know how God works. He is a God of mystery. I have decided to wrap up today's episode, so see you next time, darlings. Do not forget to give glory and thanks to our God and Father in heaven above.